Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Six Months of Set Theory and Higher Order Logic. This is month number two, looking at operations and relations of sets. We're doing a brand new video every single day for the whole of October. Now, in this video, we're going to be looking at a proof that the ordered pair AB is not equal to the ordered pair BA. Now, We've stated that our schema for an ordered pair means that order matters. Order generally doesn't matter in sets, but for ordered pairs, it does. However, we have not proved it. In this video, we will show a proof that for all classes, the order of the ordered pair of those classes matters. In other words, we're going to prove what we will call the ordered pair theorem. For all classes A and B, if A does not equal B, then AB does not equal B A. Or in other words, for all A and all B, it's not, if it's not the case that A equals B, then it's not the case that the ordered pair A B equals the ordered pair B A. If you want to, pause the video right now and try it on your own, or keep watching to see the full proof. So, this is our conclusion. To get here, we are going to do an assumed indirect proof, taking our line down as a warning. This is gonna be a long one. Um, we're denying the conclusion. It's always great to deny an implication because you get two pieces of information from it. We'll use change of quantifier to get those as existentially quantified in our negation on the inside. And then we'll existentially instantiate A and B to C and D. We'll split our implication into a disjunction affirming the antecedent and denying the consequent using implication and double negation. And then we'll use De Morgan's law to distribute that double negation across our disjunction, turning it into a conjunction and double negation to get rid of those two negations on the second half. Then, of course, we'll simplify this down to it's not the case that C equals D and the ordered pair CD equals the ordered pair DC. Because we're in an indirect proof, what we're now going to try to do is we're going to try to take this statement and show that it means that C does, in fact, equal D. That the only way you can have an ordered pair that is equal to another pair with its values switched is if those two values are the same. Once we show that, that's the opposite of premise six, and we can get out of our indirect proof. So in order to do this, we're going to use our angle bracket definition to show our definition for ordered pairs. If you want a particular challenge, go ahead and try this same proof, but with one of the other ordered pair definitions that we've looked at. And we'll do it for both CD and DC. And then using identity a couple times, we can take our premise seven from earlier and get rid of those angle brackets and treat these just as sets. So now we're going to use our curly bracket definition to define what we mean by the set of the set of C and the set of C and D, or what we've kind of extrapolated our angle brackets to be. Um, and we'll universally instantiate that into D C D equals C C D, which is the statement that we have from earlier up in premise 11. And we'll also go ahead and then instantiate, because we have that identity statement, we can pull that D, C, D in for C, D, C, C, D, rather, um, to get this statement. And then, because, of course, we can universally instantiate our identity law to say that those things are the same, we get this lovely statement that for all F, F is a member of the set of the set of D and the set of C and D is materially equivalent to F equals the set of C or F equals the set of C, D. Next up, we're going to use our curly bracket definition again to instantiate for the actual identity of D, C, D, and D, C, D, and then use the earlier premise that we have and identity to instantiate that, to show that that is 
identical, getting us for all H. H is a member of the set of D, C, D is materially equivalent to H is equal to the set of D or H is equal to the set of C, D. Now you should notice the problem here. Basically we have both F and H are supposed to be members of the same set, but F can possibly be equal to some things that H can't. Um, which is problematic unless C and D are equal. But if C and D are equal, we have a contradiction with premise six earlier. So now we're going to jump into another assumed indirect proof. And we're going to deny that for all I, I is a member of D, C, D implies that I equals C, D. So we'll go ahead and bring our negation in with change of quantifier. We'll do existential instantiation, implication, De Morgan's law and double negation. This is the same process we went through earlier with denying a universally quantified uh, implication. And we've run out of space, so we'll jump to the next page. We'll pull a couple of premises from the last page that will be useful, um, as well as the beginning of our assumed indirect proofs. Now we had just gotten to this point, we'll of course use simplification to pull those out. So we've said that J is a member of D, C, D. And it's not the case that J is equal to C, D. We can then universally instantiate premise 16 to show that if J is a member of D, C, D, then J either equals C or J equals C, D. This is the issue that we had earlier because premise 16 is problematic if C and D don't equal each other. Now, J is a member of DCD implies that J is equal to the set of C or J is equal to the set of CD and the implication in the other directions is just expanding our material equivalence and then we simplify it down. Um, we have the beginning of that implication, so we can get either J is equal to the set of C or J is equal to the set of C, D. We already have, it's not the case that J is equal to the set of C, D, so we have J is equal to the set of C. But now we can universally instantiate 18, and because we have still, it's not the case that J is equal to C, D, we can show that once again, through the exact same series of steps, J must be equal to the set of C. So we'll once again expand our equivalence. We'll go ahead and simplify that down to one of the implications. We'll use modus ponens to get down to a disjunction and disjunctive syllogism again to get J is equal to the set of D. If J is equal to the set of D, by our curly bracket definition, that means for all K, K is a member of J is materially equivalent to K is equal to D. And because we have the first half of that, we can get the second through identity. And then universally instantiate D in for K. So D is a member of J is materially equivalent to D equals D. Well, we're going to be able to get D equals D. So D must be a member of J. But once again, we've run out of room, so let's take a look. Once again, we'll pull forward some useful premises from before. And as we see, we can expand this equivalence and simplify it down to a basic implication, use our law of identity to say D equals D, so D is a member of J. We're gonna do the same thing now for J is equal to the set of C. For all K again, we instantiate K to D now because we already have going the other direction that D is a member of J. And so when we do this implication, we simplify it down to the other side of D is a member of J implies that D equals C. D equals C by modus ponens and therefore C equals D by the law of identity. And so we have conjunction, we can conjoin this with premise six earlier, saying that it's not the case that C equals D, and it is the case that C equals D. Because that's a contradiction, we can jump out of this assumed indirect proof and say that for all I, if I is a member of D, C, D, then I is equal to C, D. So I cannot be 
D alone, which is problematic for our definitions of curly brackets, as we will see in a bit. Now, we'll go ahead and instantiate premise 18 to the set of D is a member of the set of the set of D and the set of C and D is materially equivalent to D, the set of D equals the set of D, or the set of D equals the set of C comma D. As you can see, clearly the set of D equals D, and clearly the set of D is a member of the set of the set of D and the set of C and D. And so we're going to be able to pull out some interesting problems here related to the premise we just looked at. So first off, we'll spread out this equivalence and then we'll simplify it down to one of the implications in it. And once again, we will jump to another page, pulling forward some of the useful statements that we had from before. So we, of course, have the set of D equals the set of D by identity. And so through addition, we can add on the set of D equals the set of C and D, you can add anything on with disjunction to a true statement. And then we can use modus ponens to conclude that the set of D is a member of the set of the set of D and the set of C and D. Now this is of course a problem if the set of D doesn't equal the set of C and D. And that would only be the case if C and D equal each other. So we're going to universally instantiate once again premise 51 to show that the set of D is equal to the set of C and D because we showed that for any member of this set D, C, D, that has to be just C, D. We'll use identity to flip those around. And then once again, our curly bracket definition to say that for all L, L is a member of C, D is materially equivalent to L equals D because those sets are identical. And then by curly bracket definition again, we have CD, our definition based on CD, that M is a member of CD means that M is equal to D or M is equal to C. CD, of course, equals itself. So for all M, the rest of that is still true. We can universally instantiate 64 to get C is a member of CD is materially equivalent to C is equal to D or C is equal to itself equivalence to pull out those implications and simplification to simplify them down. We can then, of course, pull out C equals C through identity and then use addition to conjoin that and commutativity to switch them around so it perfectly matches. And then that shouldn't be ad com, that should be modus ponens with 67 and 69. C is a member of C, D, we have for all L, if L is a member of C, D, that's materially equivalent to L is equal to D from earlier. And we'll jump to another page and we will see that when we have that as the case, we can then instantiate in C for L to get that C is a member of C, D is materially equivalent to C equals D. We already have that C is a member of C, D from earlier. And so once we expand this using equivalence and pull out our implications, simplifying it down, we can just use a good old-fashioned modus ponens to get that C equals D. This, once again, contradicts our earlier statement that it's not the case that C equals D. And so through conjunction, we have a contradiction that allows us to finally jump out of our big long 76 line indirect proof to show that for all A and all B it's not the case that if A equals B then it's not the case that AB equals BA or our ordered pair theorem. Whew, that was a lot. But hopefully, broadly, that makes sense. I mean, this, this should be a very intuitive idea that if you have an ordered pair where ordered matters, if the two sets aren't equal to each other, then those two ordered pairs with the values switched can't be equal to each other. So hopefully this is pretty intuitive. This is just kind of showing the mechanics of why that works. 
Up next, we are moving on to a refresher on the idea of predication and how we're going to apply it to set theory. Watch this video and more here at Carneades.org. Go ahead and subscribe if you want to make sure you don't miss a single video in the whole month of set theory um, or the months to come. This is only month two out of six. Uh, and as always, stay skeptical, everybody.